All right, we good? You guys hear me all right? Loud enough? I'll talk loud. All right. Um, writing those bios are always awkward because I wrote my bio and I'm like bragging about myself. So I'm really stoked to be here. I, uh, I remember this was one of my favorite classes back when it was on the seventh floor um, of, the, of the school here, uh, 710 actually. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, my journey, going to talk a lot about Ragnar, um, where we came from, um, some of the mistakes we made, hopefully some humorous and funny stories, um, how and why we've been successful, and then some tips for my, from my experience, tips on entrepreneurship. Um, so we'll start with, uh, let's see, the story. So present co-founder. Uh, this is my info. Um, you guys can find me on the mentoring uh, site. Uh, what's it called? The BYU mentoring site. I do a, a bunch of mentoring. Um, I try to do about five hours a month, so, um, so you, I'm reasonably easy to get a hold of um, on the mentoring site. Um, and then I know some of you have heard of Ragnar, but I want to start with a video. Um, so we'll start with um, what we call the Ragnar brand anthem. Oops. example of what Ragnar is. For those of you who are not familiar um, with Ragnar, we've got two series. Um, so to give you the lay of the land, we've got the Ragnar Relay series, which is run on roads. Um, it's 12 people on a team. Each person runs three legs, and each leg is about five miles. So you put six runners in one van, you put six runners in the other van, and then you rotate, do it, you rotate through running three legs all through the night. So you run one leg during the day, one leg at night with a headlamp, flashlight, reflective vest, and then one leg um, and the next day on a Saturday. So it's a Friday to Saturday event. You run through the night relay style for about 200 miles. So it's the only relay, it's the only running event, really the only endurance sport that brings a team aspect into running. If you think about running in general, um, anybody done like a marathon, half marathon, 5K, I'm getting everybody if I say 5K, right? Um, yeah, 5K, forget that, just kidding. 
Um, so uh, if you think about a marathon or a half marathon, it's a very individualistic effort. It's a little bit selfish. That's not bad. It just is what it is, right? You're worried about your nutrition. You're worried about your PR. You're worried about your health, how you are feeling, right? In a relay, what happens very quickly is you shift from individual to team. And you start worrying about how your team's doing, how your runner's doing. Are they going to be able to get up their, um, run their middle leg at night and crest that hill while it's raining? Are they, um, are they cramping up? How are we going to cheer them on in the middle of the night? Um, and so it's this overnight, wandering, incredible adventure. Um, and then we have the Trail Relay series. So Trail Relay is a series, uh, is, um, sorry, it's a central village, so a central location with three loops that start and end in the central village. There are eight people on a team in Ragnar Trail, and you, once again, take turns running all three loops. Um, and once every runner has run all three loops, you're done. It takes about the same amount of time, but because it's trail running, it's a little bit shorter. So, um, well, it's eight runners. You still do about 15 miles per person, uh, but it takes about 24 hours to finish. You start on a, on a Friday and end on a Saturday. Um, in the village, we have campfire, s'mores, um, and instead of getting in vans, you basically bring your tent and you camp because it's just this central village area. And so you're hanging out with your, with your team, basically camping out the whole time. Um, so that's uh, what Ragnar is. Um, I want to go back a little bit to where we, to where we started. So in 1985, a guy named Steve Hill ran a race in Oregon called the Hood to Coast. Hood to Coast is similar in format, although not as good as a Ragnar. But it's a great race. It's actually sort of the, 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 the original relay race. And Bob had started, uh, in 1985, he started this race, and Steve had ran the Hood to Coast in about 1988. And he dreamed, of, he dreamed for years of doing a grand relay in Utah, just like the Hood to Coast. Um, and he actually talked to Bob Foote, the owner, about expanding. And Bob said, you know what? I tried to expand in Georgia a year ago, and it just bombed. The world, like, there, it'll never work. A relay will never work anywhere else besides Oregon. So an interesting lesson to that is in 1985 or 1988, he was probably right. Right? The running market, Steve Prefontaine and the Oregon Track Club, I mean, running was booming in Oregon, um, but around the rest of the nation, it wasn't quite experiencing the same boom. So in 88, Bob Foote was right. Um, so then we'll get to our timing. We kind of happened, onto, um, happened, to, happened upon the right timing in um, 2004 when we started. Um, I've always been an entrepreneur. Um, I started a, um, myself and a friend started a company called Mono Volleyball Company in high school. Basically what we did is we convinced a, my dad and his dad to each give us $1,000. We bought a bunch of product and then we just went out to a bunch of different volleyball tournaments and started selling this product. Ultimately what happened was we lost all that money. We had a lot of inventory left over. Um, and so we were trying to figure out what to do with this inventory. It was a dismal failure. And I literally had like, um, like my closet and his closet were just full of all this leftover volleyball product back in high school. Um, and so we were trying to figure out how to get rid of this volleyball product. And we thought, well, why don't we start, um, why don't we put on volleyball tournaments? Uh, put on a volleyball tournament. We'll do an inter high school volleyball tournament. We invited four high schools to come and do this outdoor tournament. And then for prizes, they paid us to pay, play in this volleyball tournament. And then for prizes, we gave away all our leftover product. And that was actually my first foray into events. At the time, I had no idea that I would spend you know, the majority of my adult life in um, event production. But at the time, that was how we got into it. Um, and it, at the time, it felt like it was a pretty big failure. I had borrowed money from my dad. He'd borrowed money from his dad. And it tanked, was the perception. But we learned something really important, important about event production. Um, in 2004, we, um, we were full-time students. Uh, full-time students with part-time jobs. I think I was working at the computer lab at the time. And we had this idea. We had heard Steve talk for years. Steve Hill had talked for years about doing this grand relay in Utah. So his son, Dan, and I, who I actually also started that volleyball company with, the Dismal Failure, um, we had heard him talk about this relay in Oregon for years. And finally, as we were looking at getting real jobs, 
Um, we were juniors here at BYU. We thought, you know, we should really give this a try. This could be, I mean, maybe it'll put us through, it'd be like a good grad school application, maybe it'd be some, you know, side money in the pocket. We never imagined that it would really go, ever be full time for both of us. Um, so once again, we borrowed $1,000 from his dad. So if you're keeping track, his dad had loaned us now $2,000, 1,000 of which had tanked in the volleyball company. Um, so he gave us $1,000. Um, and we basically just started begging friends and family to run this race. Um, we, we, we used a little bit of that money to go promote a couple of different marathons. Um, and really we had to get creative early on about how we were going to promote our race. Um, and so we got scrappy. We were talking to reporters. We were incessantly calling the Des News and the Trib and KSL and KUTV and trying to just drum up any stories that we could because we had no money for marketing. My favorite story from this time was, um, I don't know if, is anybody an AM radio junkie? AM radio junkies out there? Oh, I am a dork. Um, all right, so I love AM radio, and there used to be this segment called Fred Ball Speak, Zions Bank Speaking on Business. It used to be Fred Ball, now it's um, their VP of marketing. Anyway. So Fred Ball would get on and he'd highlight a business um, and it would run for a while. It got a lot of good play and so they would highlight his businesses and I thought, man, if we could get Fred Ball to do a segment on Ragnar, uh, well, that time it was the Wasatch Back Relay, that would be amazing, right? Um, so we started, um, so I, I, I actually, what I did was I looked up Fred Ball's name in the phone book. Um, I just started going through all the Fred Balls. Fortunately, there were only four. And so I just dialed the first one. I dialed it about 6 o'clock um, p.m. So it was like dinner time, hoping to catch him at home. Um, his wife answered, and I you know, answered the phone like I knew who Fred was. I was like, hey, is Fred there? She went and got Fred, and Fred answered. And fortunately, I got the right guy the first time. I said, Fred, this is Tanner Bell. I'm with a race called the Wasatch Back Relay. Um, we're Zines Bank customers. We had opened an account like a month before. Um, and he said, I said, it would be amazing if you did a, Fred, a, a speaking on business segment on us. And I explained the race, and he was not very encouraging. He's like, you know, thanks for calling me during dinner time. Um, but this is for, like, clients that have been with us for years and years and years, and it's kind of a thank you to them. And I was like, well, just think about it, and I appreciate it. And I hung up. And then about three months later, I thought it was dead, right? I thought it was dead. And about three months later, his assistant called and said, hey, we need to get some information for the Wall Switch back. We're highlighting you on speaking on business this month. Um, ironically, we had moved our bank accounts in that three months from Zines Bank to Wells Fargo. So I graciously accepted the speaking on business engagement and then we immediately moved our money back to Zines Bank. Um, so that was, a good, that was a good strategy for Zines to keep our business. Um, and we're with them today, actually. So, um, so I tell you that story, it's a little bit fun, um, but the reality is, um, you know, you, you, as an entrepreneur, you have to be scrappy. You have to figure out, sometimes the funds are not there and you have to figure out unique ways to promote your product. I should back up a little bit. Um, I kind of breezed over. So Steve had this idea of a grand relay in Utah. So in 2002, we started routing this race that started in Logan. Um, and it was actually going to be USU Stadium to, uh, to Cougar Stadium. And we couldn't figure out how to, it wasn't very safe to run down Provo Canyon at the time, still it was not. Um, and so we kind of got stumped and for about two years it, we just kind of, it kind of went away. And then in 2004, that's when we decided to bring it back. Um, and so we have this amazing, beautiful course that starts in Logan, goes over um, a mountain pass, Avon, Mount, Avon Pass into Ogden Valley, runs past Pineview, um, up to Snow Basin, um, over to East Canyon, down into uh, Rockport Reservoir, um, Echo Reservoir, Rockport Reservoir, and then right now it goes into Park City, crosses over Gardens Pass on the hardest leg of the course, which we call the Ragnar Lake, and then ends at um, Soldier Hollow. So, um, so that was our first four-way. We decided we were going to do it. Um, we, the other humorous story from that time um, was we were super unsuspecting. We actually didn't get any permits that first year. We didn't think we needed permits. We're running on private roads, so why would you need a permit? Um, and Dan's dad said to us, you know, have you guys got permits? And we're like, nah, who needs permits? Just, you know, public road, whatever. And, um, and then he said, well, why don't you call the DOT just in case? 
because we are, you know, putting porta potties on the road. So we call the DOT, this is like six weeks before the race, call the DOT. And the DOT says, uh, yeah, dude, you need a permit. You need lots of permits. And we're like, well, how long do those lots of permits take? And they're like, six weeks. And we're like, all right, what's your fax number? We're going to have to get those to you today. Um, so we learned a lot that first year. I mean, I think of sort of, I know that the, the Entrepreneur Center drives, really pushes the, um, pushes or encourages you to read the Lean Startup methodology. And I think this is a really interesting example. I hadn't read that book, but we just, we moved quickly, we iterated quickly, we learned a lot quickly, um, and ultimately kind of rolled out a product that you, would, you wouldn't even recognize as Ragnar today. It was a very, what I would call subpar based on our, on our current standards. Um, but we got out to market, we were the first ones out there. Um, we actually got 264 participants. For some of you, that sounds like a lot. Uh, for most of you, that probably sounds like a little. It was really great for us at the time. We wouldn't even like start a race for that today. That's about 12 teams and our minimum that we start races at is like, our average is about 150 teams of 12. So we started about 2,000 runners today. Um, but we were stoked with that, 264 runners. Um, obviously, we had no paycheck, right? We, we, we were just, it was all sweat equity. Uh, we weren't getting paid any money. This is what our first website looked like, in case you're wondering. We launched that very quickly. I did that, and I'm not proud of it. Um, it was actually so bad that it didn't even make it to the race. So then we launched this website. It's kind of fun to look back at what we were originally. Um, and this lasted for about a year. So Wasatch Back Relay. I think there's something here that it's like Utah's longest running party, which is not very distinctive. But um, So then um, 2004 happened, and we had this incredible experience. We didn't have any volunteers, subpar product. Um, people kind of got lost. We had signs out there, but they weren't that great. They're like laminated on paper and kind of posted to like trees and people, yeah, it was just, but we knew when, some, when people got to the finish line, we knew something special had happened, right? We started talking to people and asking how their experience was. Um, and we just like, there was just this feeling that we had stumbled upon something that was really magical. Um, so we got excited, but apprehensive about next, the next year. So. In 2005, um, we started our full-time jobs with real companies. Um, I uh, worked for PricewaterhouseCoopers um, as a, I was an information systems major, so I did system audit work. Um, so I worked for them. I started working with them, and then um, my partner started working with Bullfog Spas. Um, during that time, we, um, we, during that time, we improved the quality of the race. So we still weren't getting paychecks, but we actually had volunteers. We made nicer signs um, and, all, and actually provided porta potties so people didn't have to, like, you know, just go in and use the gas station as they were running by. Um, so 2005 was a really interesting year for us. That was the year we actually entered into the Entre Entrepreneur of the Year contest. Um, and we, we entered in in 2004 and didn't even make it to the finals. And then in 2005, we entered. And we met a mentor, um, a mentor, one of the mentors requested to be our specific mentor, Eric Jacobson. And he happened to be, um, he happened to be the director or the managing partner of Dolphin Capital, um, which is a, an investment group um, out of Park City. Um, so this is our third website, um, what it looked like. So in 2006, we actually took second place um, to J-Dogs, Tasty hot dogs. Um, so we took second place to J-Dogs and uh, met Eric. And it was this amazing experience because it was kind of like everything aligned for us. Eric Jacobson, um, I, I talked to a friend once who said, man, you guys really met like the only person in the world that would have believed in Ragnar. And I'm sure he wasn't the only person, but Eric had been an adventure racer. He had been sponsored by Go Light back in the Eco Primal Quest the Eco Challenge Primal Quest days. And he had been looking for an opportunity to invest in a in healthy, active living, lifestyle, race type of company. And he loved the concept of Ragnar. Um, he actually asked to invest. Um, initially, we told him no. We actually went to Hawaii, scouted a course with him, got really excited about it, um, and then just decided that it wasn't right for us. And then six months later, we ran out of money. Um, 
And we went back to him and we said, hey, Eric, maybe we do want that investment. Um, at the time, we were looking at launching three other races. The second year, the second year, 2005, we quadrupled in size. So we went from 262 runners to about 1,000 runners. The next year, we went to about 2,500 runners. And so we were, all of a sudden, we knew we had this amazing thing and we wanted to start expanding, see if it would work out of state. And we knew that we needed some growth capital for that. So we brought on Dolphin Capital um, in 2006 to help us grow. And we launched Great River in Minnesota, um, Del Sol in Arizona, and Northwest Passage. At this time, Ragnar didn't actually exist. Um, we were, it was the, called Backroad Events, and then each of these were relays. So it was Wasatch Back Relay, Great River Relay, Del, Relay Del Sol, and Northwest Passage Relay. Um, so, at the time, so we, we brought on Dolphin Capital, um, and it was a glorious time. Uh, we quit our real jobs. We took a 50% pay cut. Um, we didn't have insurance. Fortunately, at the time, we were still in uh, our wives. We were still young and had no kids, and our wives were still working, so we got insurance through our wives. Um, my in-laws significantly questioned my sanity because I was leaving a really sort of defined track, management track, right? I was working for PricewaterhouseCoopers, one of the best accounting firms in the nation. You know, it was, it was kind of like the thing I was supposed to do. Um, and my, my in-laws were supportive, but very nervous, right? That I was going to start a race. Um, I still have people today that say, wow, like, that's all you do? And I'm like, yeah, me and, you know, 60 people and like 36 races, right? Um, but it didn't quite compute. They weren't sure if we would make any money, if it, if it really made any sense. Um, and it was a big decision point for us too, bringing on money, because we had to really decide, at that time, um, there were a lot of other, there's some big event companies, right? There's, there's the big guys like Ironman, um, Lifetime Fitness, which owns a bunch of races of triathlons around the nation, um, Competitor, who owns like the Rock and Roll Marathon series. And we knew that if we didn't grow quickly, Right? If we weren't aggressive with, with launching our series, we knew we had this microcosm of awesomeness with three or four races. But we knew that if we didn't go quickly, we would get knocked off very quickly. The barrier to entry is, it's actually a little bit bigger in relay than we originally estimated, but we knew that the big guys could compete with us. And so we, had, we made the decision to bring on money. And we had, ultimately it was a decision of, do we want to be a really healthy like regional company with three or four races? Or do we want to you know, take over the world and own 80% of the relay market and be expanding into all these other opportunities? And there's nothing wrong with being a healthy regional company. Um, that would have been a great decision for us. It was, for us, it was just what we wanted to do. We wanted to sort of go for that ride and see if we could create this amazing, amazing race, um, amazing series. When we took on our investment from Dolphin, um, we were kind of a mess from a brand perspective. Um, it, I would say it was a pretty muddled brand. Um, uh, like I said, we were an event company and then we had four different race names and there was no overarching sort of message, right? And so Eric, our investor, our, the managing partner of Dolphin, he said, if I give you guys money, the first thing you have to do is spend it on, the first expenditure is on going through a brand process. And so we hired a group called the Summit Group. Um, they're still here in Salt Lake City. Um, and they helped us go through um, our brand. This is our website, uh, 4.0. You can see it's a little bit muddled, right? I mean, our, our logo, there's nothing unique about this logo. If you can see it at the top, uh, you see this little, see that little like two people handing off? Like there's nothing distinct or unique about that logo. That's like a logo that every relay could have, like one dude passing off to the other or a man passing off to a woman. Um, you know, Utah's longest party, um, uh, you know, there's just nothing like really like core to this. It's actually orange because at the time Zango was the title sponsor and that was Zango's color. And so we didn't even have like really a, a color palette or like a mission or a sense of who we were. We just knew that we wanted to put on these really cool overnight relay races. So we started to go through this really painful, um, this really painful process with the summit group. Um, and I say painful because we really invested in it. We really invested in going through this branding process and understanding who we were and what we stood for and what the mission of the company was and what the values were. Um, and we struggled with it. We actually initially, 
Um, Ragnar actually comes from the hardest leg on the Wasatch Back course, Wasatch Back Relay course, it's called the Ragnar leg. And initially it came from um, the, one of the partners, Steve Hill, he knew two rough, tough, burly guys growing up named Ragnar, random, right? Not just one, but two guys named Ragnar. And so he just started calling rag, like burly people Ragnar, like, dude, that guy is, you know, such a Ragnar, right? And so when we saw this like burly leg on the course, it's like two, three miles and like 2,000 feet of elevation gain or something absurd like that. We were like, let's call this the Ragnar leg. So everyone, everything else is like leg one, leg two, leg three, and then you get to leg 33 and it's the Ragnar leg. Um, and so we started to go through the brand process and, and um, Summit Group and Eric were like, what about Ragnar? And we were like, no, like that's, we do not want to call it Ragnar. And the reason why was because we envisioned Ragnar being this inclusive brand, right? So you, anybody done Iron Man? Half Iron Man? Anybody seen Iron Man? All right, all right. There's a, that guy, we got an Iron Man back there, right? You raise your hand, half Iron? Congrats, that's awesome, it's a huge accomplishment. Um, so Iron Man is super exclusive, right? Is there, Iron Man is um, like, oh boy, it's like a marathon, uh, 100 mile bike, and a two and a half mile swim, is that right-ish? Yeah, so it's just brutal, right? I mean, not very many people honestly can do an Iron Man. You have to train, you have to kind of give up your life. Um, it's just a super exclusive brand, right? And our vision for Ragnar was to be the inclusive Ironman, right? Anybody can do it with a little bit of training. And so when they said Ragnar, we want you to name it Ragnar, we were like, no, that's a terrible idea because Ragnar stands for the hardest leg on the course. That's gonna scare people away. And so we went to, we actually, these are the preliminary logos. I'm sorry you guys can't see them very well, but it was initially gonna be called Back Road Relay Series. Super sexy, right? Um, and, you know, we played around with these ideas of like a band of brothers thing and some mountains and, you know, just, and we were, we went down this path and I'm so grateful. At the time I was so mad, but there was a race in Colorado called the Boulder Backroads Marathon. Um, and Bull, and, and our attorney said, if you're going to call it Backroad Relay, you need to check with them and get permission. And they, and that race turned us down. And I was so mad at them at the time. I was like, like, just be nice, right? What's wrong? And, um, and I'm so grateful to this day because they, we decided not to use it. We probably still could have, but then we would have gotten embroiled in a lawsuit and <laughs> nobody wants that, right? So then we went back to Ragnar. We were kind of desperate. We we're like, okay, let's, let's consider Ragnar and if we can change the meaning of it to this accessible experience, that would be pretty cool. And, so, and then we found out that Ragnar was this 9th century Norse hero, sort of this mythological Viking king person, right? And so we started to go down the path of Ragnar with these sort of what we call doohickeys and a crown. And, and we almost launched this. I mean, like literally, like we're like, okay, we're going to, you know, we're going to move forward on this. And then we woke up the next day and we're like, no, it just does not feel good, right? Also super sexy, right? Um... And finally, we actually, it's a good lesson in persistence because some group said it was going to take about six weeks and this process took us about six months. Um, and what we actually did was the marketing firm wasn't getting it. And so we actually took our, um, we actually went to, at the time there was a company, I think it was a BYU company, you may remember them. Um, there was a company that would just like, you tell them what you, like explain sort of the concept and then they would, send you like 25 logos from like five different designers, right? And from those, we actually got something similar to this and then we gave it back to someone group and we said, go this direction. And this is what we ended up getting. And most of you have heard of Ragnar because you are in Utah. Um, it's a pretty iconic mark today, right? 10 years, 12 years later, um, I mean, you know, I, we're probably the, I believe we're the only endurance series that inspires people to literally tattoo the logo permanently on their body, in, with the exception of Iron Man. Iron Man's the other one. And we can talk about the ethical implications of that later. Um, <laughs> but ultimately, I feel a lot of responsibility for that. I don't have a Ragnar tattoo, right? And other people do. And so we better do them right, right? We tell, I tell our employees all the time, like, we have to respect what they've built. I mean, we've sort of curated it, and, but, but the participants have built it for us. 
and it means as much to them as it does to us. Um, so yeah, there's like hundreds of Ragnar Tutus out there. It's crazy. Um, so that brings us to um, 2013. We actually went through this whole brand process, and I don't want to give you the perspective that brand is just a logo, but that was a big part of it. Um, so this is what we look like today. Um, so this is our mission and then the Ragnar personality. It's a lot of words, but it's pretty important, so I'm going to read it to you. Um, this is basically what we came up with. So, well, two things. Our initial mission, when we, when we finished with... Um, when we finished our brand process, our initial mission was to be the largest series of overnight relay races in the nation. And we're, we, we eclipsed that in about five years. And so this is not our original mission, but that was a huge BHAG for us, right? Like the nasty goal that we had to get to. But once we got there, it's not a great mission because you've already accomplished it. So today our mission is to inspire a global tribe of adventurers, ordinary people who seek the extraordinary. So for us, we're building a lifestyle brand. When you participate in Ragnar, it says something about who you are, the choices you make, and the people you associate yourself with. Um, you notice Global Tribe, for us, the global is the BHAG. We want to be an international organization. So we, we expect to see Ragnar in, um, in internationally um, very short, or shortly. Um, and then, once again, the ordinary to extraordinary is what guides our focus. We want to be that exclusive exclusive, um, or I'm sorry, that inclusive endurance brand. Ragnar is a legendary Norse, a hero of Norse mythology. He was a larger than life explorer, adventurer, and wild man. We are the modern caretaker, ta caretakers of Ragnar's legacy and aspire to the same free-spirited, tenacious, and fearless life that he lived. Ragnar's embrace the freedom to explore, to conquer, to seek the extraordinary. We contend that a little sleep deprivation is a small price to pay to watch the sun rise with our friends. We propose that within each of us is potential for true greatness. Within each of us is Ragnar. Um, a, as a tribe, we see life differently. We're not worried about our finish time, finishing times as we are about finishing together. We'll stop running to give water to a stranger at 3 a.m. We'll dance on top of a van in a rather unflattering spandex bodysuit if that's what it takes to get our teammates to the finish line. We will lift ourselves out of deep sleep just to cheer our teammates as they run by. Vans without decorations look naked, and to us, a neon tutu will make anybody a little bit sexier. That's three times I've used sexy. Um, we are a tribe of wild, vibrant adventurers of all skill levels who just want to help each other appease their voracious appetite for exploration and feed their sense of wonder. So that's who we are, right? That guides every decision we make, is that ordinary to extraordinary, explore, conquer, um, and wild man. Um, Told you I wouldn't have a hard time, right? Um, I'm running out of time, so I've got a little bit of time, but um, so then the brand, um, when uh, the great thing about dialing in a really strong brand and then committing to it is that it does define your decision. So in 2011, we started to have some assaults from some competitors. We own about 80% of the relay market, but some, some of our competitors started to launch what we call day relays. Well, they call them day relays. We call them half Ragnars, which don't even exist because we don't do them. But the day relays, um, the day relays are, are basically our format, but it just goes from you know, Friday. So it's, um, I think it's 12, 18 legs or 12 legs, right? And it's a great format. I'm, not, I'm not, um, not putting it down. But for Ragnar, our special sauce is the overnight, right? There's something magical about running overnight, you know, being giddy, um, wondering, questioning your, your decisions, wondering why you're running this crazy thing. And then the sun comes up and you start to, like, understand, like, why, you know, why you did this. And, and so the day relay, it started to make an impact. You know, some, some people started to get traction with it. And we were like, man, maybe we should do day relays. But we stuck to our guns. And we actually launched a trail relay series two years later. Um, and it has paid off significantly. We actually now have in three years, well, next year, in four years, we'll have more trail relay races than we do road relay races. So it took us 10 years to get to uh, 15 road relay races. And it'll take us four years to get to about 19 trail relay races. Um, so the great thing is, this is still, I mean, re ra road relays are still our core product, but this is driving growth at Ragnar today. It's an incredible concept, 
It's just one deviation away, so it doesn't feel like it's offending the brand. It's still overnight. Um, really an incredible concept. Um, I don't think I'll play the video because um, I don't know that we have time, but we can play at the end. Um, so we came up with this trail relay concept, but we needed some growth capital to get that done. We wanted once again to launch big because if we go slow, you know, some of the other relay or some of the other event companies can knock us off. So um, in 2003, we actually were fortunate enough to connect with um, Partnership Capital Group, um, and they actually introduced us to White Road Investments. White Road Investments is the investment arm of Cliff Bar. So Gary Erickson um, is the founder of Cliff Bar. Uh, he has a great book called Raising the Bar. Um, talks about you know business and ethics, and he has an incredible story. But he sold um, tw some a portion of his company back to his employees in an in in employee stock option agreement. And he took that money and started a fund. And they invest in healthy, active living companies. So these two companies co-invested um, in Ragnar about three years ago, um, gave us the capital to launch trail relays super aggressively. Um, and that has been a huge, huge, um, uh, I don't know, blessing for us, frankly. They're great, great partners. I mean, Cliff Bar is the dominant energy bar company in the market, so they're a perfect, a perfect group for us to be involved with. You can't see this map, but today, Ragnar, in 2016, Ragnar will have 18 road relay races, including joint ventures on a race in New Hampshire called Reach the Beach, um, and, um, and then a, a joint venture on a race in Kentucky called Bourbon Chase. We also just launched our Hawaii race, so if you guys want to have your first relay in Hawaii, feel free. It's amazing. We got 200 teams in the first two weeks of launching that race. So that's kind of like indicative of, of the strength of the brand. Um, this doesn't show Hawaii because we just launched it. Um, and then, as I said, we'll have about uh, 19 trail relay races around the nation. So in total, we'll be at about 37 relay races all in in, um, in uh, 2016. Um, and then these are just some perspectives of what Ragnar is today. You see, you know, the team of, of women um, gathered around. There's, this is the finish line arch right there. We have the most incredible um, venues, uh, courses in the nation. This is our trail arch um, and the, um, you know, team cheering them on. And then this is what Ragnar Village looks like with the bonfire. Um, so, so this is kind of what you see Ragnar today. Um, so really quickly, I'm going to buzz through um, some advice that I have for entrepreneurs. Um, reasons for success. I know that probably everybody says this, but it is so true. Um, entrepreneurship is about uh, hard work, long hours, and a lot of failure. Um, and you got to get through that failure to have a success. And passion for me was key. Finding something that I loved, that I was excited about. Um, I, frankly, I wasn't even a runner when we started Ragnar. No joke, never ran track, never run a marathon. When Dan and Steve told me about it, I was like, man, that would actually get me to run. That sounds amazing. Like, I loved run, throwing parties in high school. This sounds like I'm throwing a party. Like, rock, rock on, right? Um, the right partners, so integral in our success has been the right partners. Um, you know, we, I really look at myself 10 years ago versus today and you know, understanding um, how to buy and sell a business, how to do mergers and acquisitions, how to build a brand, how to create value. I mean, just something as simple as how to create value. Having those partners early on has been so integral for us. Dolphin Capital, Partnership Capital, um, Cliff Bar. Um, Amy Donaldson was a reporter that has been so supportive of us, has written literally you know, 30, 40 articles over the last 10 years. KSL, um, our marketing firm, and then our title sponsor, Solomon, of, uh, of the Trail Relay series. We launched Trail Relay. It was wildly successful, and it was essentially because we launched with a trail, a trail running shoe that gave us a lot of credibility. Um, I've already beat this like a dead horse, but tenacious about our brand. We are super aggressive. Everybody in the company, from finance to operations to merchandise to marketing, all make decisions based on our brand and what's going to be best, what's going to fit those, that brand, those brand decisions. Um, taking care of our top performers um, and then being loyal to our runners and sponsors. We definitely, for us, put the Ragnarian first. Um, 
So the best about being an entrepreneur, you define the vision, strategy, and brand of the company. In my opinion, like the most amazing part. Um, and that's why it's so important to have the right partners. Um, you set the tone of the company and you pick your coworkers. I love picking my coworkers because then I don't have to work with jerks. Um, you get to do cool things like play ultimate. We have a ultimate Wednesday. Every Wednesday we play ultimate Frisbee. Every Friday we do Waffle Fridays. Um, uh, you get to work on your passion project. Um, it opens doors for you that you never would have, could have have opened. If we were a regional company, it would be a great company, but I wouldn't have, you know, been able to, um, to have the opportunities I have and the connections I have. And then you get to set your own dress code. You don't have to shave like twice a week if that. Uh, and that's nice. Uh, the worst is skipping paychecks or not even getting paychecks. Um, fear of not making payroll is the worst feeling in the world because uh, you have people depending on you. Um, the sacrifices you and your family have to make can be challenging. And then um, I hate letting people go. I hate firing people. Uh, Donald Trump glamorizes it too much. Um, so my advice, there's never a good time to start a business. Um, I sat in this class 10 years ago and I remember one of the guys said, I would go out into the workforce and work for a couple years before I start a business. And I'll tell you, the reality for me was that it was more defined by the idea than by the time. Because if I hadn't started the relay, the Ragnar, at the time that I did, it wouldn't have been, the opportunity wouldn't have been there a year later. And so for me, my advice is find the right idea. If you don't have the idea, then use, take that entrepreneurial mindset and create value somewhere else. Go work for a startup. Who cares? Go work for a real company, right? But create value and be an entrepreneur in your organization and then find that idea. Um, be passionate about your company. Be prepared to sacrifice long hours and hard work. Find a mentor. And then lastly, be righteous. Um, after 10 years, um, which is not a long time, but after 10 years, I got to tell you, that whole, like, you know, no failure in the family can compensate for success in the world, it rings so true to me today. And so I will tell you the one thing, the main piece of advice I have for you is be righteous um, and, and live, live your values because it will pay off. Um, I think that's it. Oh, yeah, and then we could talk about financing if you guys have questions. So thanks for having me. Sorry to go over.